such a great job with this country. Well, thank you. All my friends are very proud also to well, have such a fine man in the White House. <laughs> we just wish he could run another term. <laughs> well, the foundation is laid there at White Pigeon. Did you ever see or know White Pigeon? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Grew up real close together. Lived there for 20 years. Mm -hmm. the, I can still remember the great, the great reward every day was, if we'd all been good and everything, was that Nickel bottle of strawberry pop. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, your grandmother was a wonderful, wonderful woman. I'm sure she was. My mother was the youngest of the whole clan, the, the last uh -huh. child. She, she really was devoted to, uh -huh. to so her sister Jenny. Right yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Dixon, Illinois, was as far away as we got. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed a long way, didn't it? Well, listen, I have just a couple of little souvenirs here. And I think, Terry, I want to get a, a nice well, post photo, too. Right. Right. That's just a pin for a souvenir. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, all right. Mm -hmm. Why don't we... Uh, yeah, this, yeah. This you get in the middle, it'll be a prettier picture. All right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Just turning up the spring. <laughs> I think you're the best. You believe it or not, no, no, someone sent it. I don't know whether they approved what we were doing here or disapproved. Wait just a moment here. fine work that you've done this past year. You've produced a series of reports that represent the most comprehensive review of the defense establishment, I think, since World War II or before. And you've shown the way to real reform and have conclusively laid to rest the myths about you know, some of the defense procurement things that abounded in the press only a year ago. 
Dave, your looted leadership and your vast talents as a senior captain of industry and your universally acclaimed spotless record of integrity have made this commission successful, and I think all Americans owe you and your compatriots here a debt of gratitude. Now, I understand that you want to tell me what's said in the final report. Yes, I'd like to take a few minutes, Mr. President. <coughs> sessions of Congress. Congress happy to bail out of Washington. Yeah, the President was glad to see him go. Air conditioning was the air. scourge of the country. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> and uh, air conditioning is one of the most hurtful things that's happened to go. <laughs> Most people still want to come to Washington. Can't seem to keep them away. Well, not that air conditioning. Yeah. Not that fast. Well, they, I think they wanted to come even read about her once in my phone here. Do you remember the young lady? She was a teacher in the American school in Egypt. And on Malta, she was the one that the hijacker shot in the head and then threw her down the plane. Oh. and a special hello to your executive director, Julia Ninchek. And it's certainly a pleasure for me as honorary chairman of the People to People program to have this opportunity to speak with you before you're off on your great adventure. These exchange programs in which you and many thousands of others participate, I think are one of the most important ways for others to learn about our values and our views. During your time overseas, you were likely be confronted with many foreign policy questions. There's every reason for Americans to be proud of our country's dealings with other nations. We've been a force for freedom and a force for peace on this planet. And when we turn over the reins to your generation, that won't be so long from now, we want this to be a safer planet than it is today. That's what the negotiations in Geneva are all about. There's a great deal of maneuvering that goes on during such negotiations, but I'm still optimistic. The United States is willing to do more than put a lid on the number of 
of nuclear weapons. We're proposing to reduce U.S. and Soviet nuclear arms to an equal and verifiable level. And it's in the interest of both the Soviet Union and the United States to do this. If the Soviets will agree, we can get started on this right now. While trying to achieve nuclear and conventional arms reductions, we're exploring technologies that will protect people from the threat of ballistic missiles. This is our research under our Strategic Defense Initiative, which everyone knows as SDI. If we're successful, those missiles will be less effective, and thus both sides will be all the more likely to agree to cut deeply the number of these weapons in their arsenals. And if that one day leads to a shield against ballistic missiles, the whole world, I think, will breathe easier. You young people, more than any other group, have a stake in the future. I'm going to be speaking at a high school graduation in Glassboro, New Jersey next week. It will be my first high school graduation in quite some time. And some of the matters under discussion, the future of peace and freedom, will be on the agenda. But now I know that you have some things that you'd like to discuss, so we should allow the press to retire and, and we can get on with our discussions. Well, Mr. President, there's still a lot of confusion, sir, about the SALT agreement last night. Did you mean to say that SALT is dead? And did you sign off on the, the limits for the uh, air launch cruise missiles? Did you uh, definitely decide to do that? And is SALT dead? What I was saying is we'll make the decision uh, with regard to the ballistic missile or the cruise missile when uh, that time comes, but in the interim, we're going to be dealing with the Soviet Union on their most recent proposal to us. Uh, the time has come to replace a treaty that was never ratified, that has now gone beyond the length of time for which it was designed, which they have never observed, have been violating since its inception, to replace that with a legitimate arms reduction treaty. Now, so salt, the same last night. Mr. Salt President. is dead? What? Salt yes. is dead then? Uh, we're going to try to replace it with a better deal. Why won't you say it when your spokesman is saying it very stories. flatly to us? We need it from you. Uh, is it dead or isn't it? <laughs> I mean, Larry Speed told us that's that's very all. definitively that it is dead, and, yes. and yet you won't say it. Thanks very much. Thank you. I think you could trust what Larry speaks okay. said to well, you. Well, he also told us, sir, this yeah, morning no, that you on. had signed off on definitely exceeding the limit for air launch cruise missiles. One of the reasons I'm not saying to that is because right now we are going to do our utmost to engage the Soviet Union in an arms reduction agreement. And uh, anyone going into negotiations, I think, has a right to remain silent. So that nothing will be used against him. Okay. Okay. Let's, you let's go, Frank. Let's go. Thank you. We have good protectors here. Let's go, Frank. Okay. Let's go. This happens all the time. No more film. <laughs> <laughs> let's. This way. Go ahead. This way. <laughs> Leslie, I know that I'm expected to hear from you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My name is Leslie McCallum, and I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. On behalf of People to People International, we would like to thank you for being with us today. Since 1963, thousands of young Americans have represented our country overseas as People to People High School student ambassadors. This summer, student ambassadors will continue fostering international understanding and goodwill through overseas programs and home stays with nearly 4,000 host families. The program's mission will take this year's student ambassadors to 24 different countries throughout Europe and Europe. This summer, I will be participating in the Initiative for Understanding, the American Soviet Youth Exchange. This program is a direct result of your United States Soviet Exchange Initiative following the recent Geneva Summit Conference. Its purpose is to provide the opportunity for direct communication between the young people of the United States and the Soviet Union. My fellow student ambassadors meeting with you here today will be participating not only in the Soviet initiative, but in equally important exchanges in Eastern and Western Europe. Again, we sincerely appreciate this opportunity to be with you. Well, listen, I'm 
very pleased and honored to meet with all of you. You know, I have long had a belief that we only get in trouble when we're talking about each other instead of to each other. And I just have to believe that if all the young people of the world could get to know each other, there'd never be another war. Wars are caused by governments, not by people. The tragic problem with regard to the Soviet Union is that unlike our country, their people don't have any influence on the government. They're not even allowed to criticize it, let alone vote for it. So it does make a difference. But uh, a generation coming up in which we all know each other. May I ask you something then? I know you've got some questions here. Uh, I don't know what preparation is given you know, when you're going to go to these other countries and all. We're about our own. And I do know that when I was your age, uh, I had some pretty fixed ideas and was a little <laughs> cynical about some of the things in our country and having to do with government and big business and all. And I've become uh, much more tolerant as the years have gone on. For example, I could understand if you had a belief that, well, the big business and the big corporations and so forth. I had quite a lesson in that, about how wrong I was for feeling that way. I was doing a television show for eight years for the General Electric Theater. Part of that show, the head of the company, Ralph Corden, that giant corporation, thought that it would be wise if I was sent around to the some 139 plants that General Electric had in 39 states and visit and meet the employees. I met a quarter of a million employees in those eight years. I'd go on about 10 weeks a year on the road, one two week stretches meeting these people. And then they made me available to make speeches also, like to the Chambers of Commerce or whoever asked me. And there was always somebody asking. And one day, the young man who went on the, these trips with me told me, called me and told me that Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA, had told General Electric that if they didn't fire me, uh, they would take $50 million a year in business away from General Electric. It seems that they, General Electric, in all those years of making speeches, never told me once what to say or what not to say. I wrote my own speeches, and I was pretty much then talking about free enterprise. That was against government, that government had become too obtrusive and so forth. And, and uh, I had used TVA as an example of the government getting into private business and competition with free enterprise and so forth. And this was TVA's reaction. And I asked this fellow, and he called me, and I said, oh, George, we're going out on the road in just a few days, and I'm going to be making the same speech. And I said, what does Ralph Gordon say? He says, no one's heard from him. So a day or two goes by, and I still haven't heard from Ralph Gordon. Finally, it dawned on me, uh, we weren't going to hear from him. So I picked up the phone and I called Ralph Cordner. Now, that isn't as easy as it sounds. There was the head of this giant corporation, the chairman of the boys and board and all of that. And I was an actor. And uh, I was getting into some pretty rarefied atmosphere. But I called him and I told him what I'd heard. And he said, well, uh, I'm sorry that you heard about that. He said, it's my problem. And he said, I have told Tennessee Valley Authority that General Electric has never told an employee what they can or can't say and we're not going to start. And I said, well, Mr. Cordner, I'm not going to take up your time to tell you what that means to me to hear you say that. But I would hate to think that some of those employees I met at the turbine plant in Schenectady might be laid off because of something I said in the speech. Well, he said, that's a price we'd have to pay. There's a principal involved here. And I said, Mr. Cordner, what would you say if I told you I can make that same speech and be just as effective and I don't have to use TVA as an example? And there was a pause, and then a very human voice said, well, it would make my job easier. <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought you might hear in case you thought, when you go, you're going to find people with a lot of different viewpoints. Well, yeah, it's a little back there. You come on in and right. sit down. Hi, Don. How are you? Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you, but I, I was counting. I don't get any facts from the vote on the hour. Really? I don't get any facts from the yes. vote on the hour. 
Yes. I have I have a brief on that. That's a pretty good Let's leave it while I Well, Mr. President, first of all, thank you for seeing us on short notice. Secondly, uh, Bill Armstrong, who requested